Hello everyone, thanks for coming. So, you just heard my name, I'm Nelson Bides, and this talk is going to be in the context of Mongoose IM, mostly about open source and the community. Let's get started. So, first of all, who is the presenter? So, this is me, I'm Nelson Bides, uh, Erlang consultant and core Mongoose IM developer. I have been working in Erlang Solutions for over three years and a half, more or less, Mongoose IM from the beginning. For me, programming is a hobby, a free time thing, it's something that I can do like on Saturday morning after a long Friday night, it's like, if I have nothing else to do, it's fun. Like, I can just hack stuff and it, it's, it's a good entertainment. And I have an unhealthy obsession with performance. I often get reminded of, you know, first make it beautiful and then later make it fast. I get reminded of that very often because I tend to over-optimize every single tiny detail. I, it's, it's an obsession. This is how I got started. This is the actual picture of the day when I met Robert Verden. Um, one day, there was a meetup in Krakow. I was working in C, and I heard about Erlang. I was a total beginner, but I was super curious, and it looked like really a really, really smart way of doing concurrency, which was a problem for me working in C. So I went to this meetup, and I was asking a question to the presenters, and after some point, the, the guy said something like, you know what, this question is complicated, but we can ask Grover Building, he's there. And I'm like, what? Amazing. So I went to him, talked to him for hours, and this is already very early in the presentation, the first lesson on open source and the community. A legend, Robert Birding, one of the creators of Erlang, you spend three hours of his life on his trip to Krakow talking to a random kid he never saw before. And I learned so much. Shortly after, I started working in Erlang Solutions. Enough about me, let's go with uh, the project. And so Mongoose IAM is, in essence, a customizable messaging server. That's like in a tagline. But it is implemented in Erlang, and of course, thanks to Erlang, it's robust, scalable, and efficient. That's typical buzzwords for, for Erlang. How scalable? This is a load test that we made uh, over a year and a half, two years ago, more or less, where we wanted to check how linear the growth is. This is measuring the number of sessions, sending a message every uh, 15 seconds, so that's an average. Usually you send like, you know, four messages quick and then there is a long pause. So as an average, message every 15 seconds. And how many users can be connected before the machine is saturated? So in this small C5 uh, large, which is two CPUs, four gigas of RAM, it can take 137,000 connections and it grows with the CPU, more or less linearly, up to that one when we run out of AWS credits. This gets very expensive to test. That machine had uh, 64 cores and 100 gigas of RAM, 108 or something like that. You can check on the documentation for, for the AWS machines. Where we managed to connect, two and a half million. This is, of course, like the speed limit of your car, where it says that it can go at 215, but you never go at 215. You know, the road is not that perfect, like the one the car was tested on. Also, it's usually not illegal. It's usually illegal. Uh, and sometimes in your car, you have things on the, um, on the truck, and you have more passengers, so the car is heavier. So. But it gives you an idea of the theoretical performance. In this place, I'm, I'm based in Europe, I, I'm based in Poland. And a few months ago, here in this corner, for those of you that may not know where Coruña is, I gave pretty much this presentation, plus uh, some improvements and updates. And there, I presented this statistic. The University of Coruña has this many students with administrative staff and academic staff. That is rounding up, let's say, 20,000 people. Imagine that you make a chat server for the University of uh, Coruña, and you get this uh, small machine, the C5 Large, that we saw before, and pe the people start sending a lot of messages. Like, everyone gets crazy sending messages. I don't know, it's exam times and so on. You can get 60, 68,000 sessions sending messages like crazy, in a machine that has two CPUs and four gigas of RAM. My grandma has a phone with more resources than that. 
and it's enough for a whole university. The context of uh, Mongoose IM, how it's implemented. Like, there is a, a few important things in Mongoose IM. We use persistent terms for configuration, C2S processes, representing the client to server uh, connection, hooks and handlers, this will be important, worker pools and APIs. Let's go through them quickly. A side note, this guy in this book was told that for every formula in his book, he will sell half of the number of books. So I'm trying to take a lesson here, probably for every piece of code that I write, half of you will fall asleep. So don't read it. There is some slides with code that will just explain it. Don't read it, just don't fall onto Stephen Hawking's trap. So configuration, MongoSM has changed. In the past, it used to be a Erlang terms uh, file that then was uh, stored in arbitrarily nested niche and ETS tables depending on the piece of configuration. The archive configuration was stored in one place, the listeners in a different one. It was a bit uh, messy and one day we were told that uh, Mongoose IM configuration is the trenches of the sum of Mongoose IM, so we decided to fix this. And for version five, uh, 4, we made the configuration in TOML, but everything was in the background translated to the same distributed mess, and by version 5.1, this was fixed in a single persister term tree that represents the TOML tree in the configuration. So now both like front end and back end are really clean, readable, easy to code and work with. This is one of my favorite pieces of code ever. It's so fantastic. It was, it was also one of the favorite, my favorite pull requests that I saw coming to Mongoose IM. When you want to check some configuration, TOML describes that in a tree, and you want to just parse the tree and arrive to the, the value for your key. So you just give a list with your keys, and in five lines of code, you check the config. It's beautiful. A bit more how MongoSM works. There is a top EJRD supervisor for historical reasons that this part, to be precise, is work in progress, but it's pretty much there. Uses range. We used to have a pretty much like architecture-wise copy of Ranch 1.7. Eventually, we decided to use Ranch 2.0 and you know have less duplication. Ranch spawns a bunch of supervisors with uh, listeners. The listeners on connection spawn uh, against Tatem that represents the XMPP protocol. Pretty much how OTP implements SSL. It's also a similar idea. The state machine protocol has uh, different states for waiting for stream, authentication, till you have a connection, and then you send messages. Uh, the um, place where messages are, once you have a connection, it works pretty much like this. You receive a TCP packet, you decode it if it's encrypted, you parse the XML. MongoSIM is an XMPP server, so it's XML based. You parse it and generate a new list of events that are then uh, handled here in the state machine. For every event, you run a hook that says there is a new message, new event. Somebody wants to do something with it. If everything is correct, you route it and then handle uh, the result and go to the next state. And the other place when, like this is when the user sends a message with his device, when someone else sends a message to the user, is routed this way, you receive an info event, one of these exclamation marks, with a route and the accumulator. Again, you parse, you run the event, now you receive a packet, you didn't send it. If everything is correct, you put it in the socket. These events, things that can be handled in those events are, for example, metrics like for the system, push notifications, there is a new message, the user is not online, so we want to plug it to the push notification the backend. You can send carbon copies. When you have two devices, you send a message in one. You want the other synchronized. Typical messaging experience. I'm sure you're all familiar. How is this event thing working? So there is a few steps of it. On the one hand, you have to like register the event, and then you fire the, the, the handlers that were registered for this event. So first, you add a handler. You check that was not added before, and then you insert it in a certain order in the table that contains them. And then when you want to trigger the event, you look up the table, get your list of handlers, and execute them one by one. This is very similar to the next piece of code 
that to this one, uh, most of you will be very familiar. You insert the handler. Uh, this time, you check in a different way. You check if the ETS table already contains it. If it doesn't, you insert it. When you want to run it, you get the list of events for the event uh, name and execute them one by one. That one is the code for telemetry. That is this very important library that you should all be using. It's uh, already plugged into Phoenix and many other systems, for example. When I joined Erlang Solutions uh, three and a half years ago, Arik was uh, just releasing the, the, the telemetry, and it was like a, a, a hot topic, and I was totally not familiar with it. I was, I was new to, to the whole ecosystem. And you know, hearing telemetry all the time, so I went to Arik and said, Arik, what, what is this? Like, give me an, an introduction. And we went to the conference room, to the whiteboard, and he drew something like this that he reconstructed from memory years later. So more or less, this is what, what he drew. So you have this concept of an event, and you want to trigger handlers. OTP gives you the GAN event that when, if a handler fails, it's removed, but it's asynchronous. The event is given to a server that will run all the handlers. And that doesn't scale. If like every C2S process, you have a million people sending messages, they all run the new message arrive. There is one process that will get one million notifications, please run this event, it's a bottleneck. So what you would want to do is that each one of those client processes executes the event with the handlers. So this is what MongoSIM had and what telemetry wanted to achieve. Uh, telemetry kept the idea of removing and fail. In Mongoose IM, we want to continue executing the happy cases. If like some handler is broken, it's broken for some input, but not for the others. So it will tell you logs, metrics, everything, but the happy cases are still executed, so we don't remove and fail. But the main difference is the reduced order. This is something very specific to Mongoose IM that doesn't play well in a generic open source library like telemetry. The idea is that the list of handlers in MongoSIM are executed one after another in a defined order, and the output of one handler is given to the next. This may introduce some dependency between handlers, so it doesn't go well for a, for a, um, it doesn't go well for a generic open source library, and this was a bit of an inspiration from Arek for not, what not to put on, the, on this generic library. So, more on open source telemetry. A bit more on MongoSIM. IM. So we have the, the tree that we defined before. And there is more processes using a worker pool. This will be a Inaka library. And the worker pool starts a bunch of pools for the RDBMS, for example, to keep the RDBMS connections. This is not an infinite resource. Like, Theoretically, no resource is infinite, but you can spawn, provided the machine is big enough, you can spawn a million C2S processes, but you cannot spawn a million DB connections, DBB goes crazy. Uh, authentication pools, MAM is the message archive management, inbox is the, your main view when you enter the, your chat. And in this users and packet event, we just give information to all these other pools, uh, also metrics, carbon copies, as I mentioned before. When the user sends a packet, it goes to route, so you check the domain, XMPP defines something a la emails for the identification, for identifying a, a, a connection, a, a session. You check the domain, check the, what you have to do with routing, if it's federated, if it's a local, uh, local routing, if it's local, you go do some filtering, maybe privacy, maybe more metrics. If you're writing to a room, the room checks the list of users and does the routing again for the list of users. Otherwise, you're routing to a final user, you query the session manager, the session manager says for this email like, it's called G, the Java identifier. For that, you get this PID and you send a message with an exclamation mark, it's taken in the other place we saw before. We also have uh, APIs. We have uh, like client and admin API. The client API replicates a lot of what you can do in XMPP. You would do it in REST or GraphQL. 
and the admin API allows you to register users, domains, what you would expect. Um, now, to be released very, very soon, within the next few weeks, we'll release a MongoSM 6.0 with a GraphQL um, front end. We rework how REST works and how CLI works. So we have like three front ends and one back end, and then you can request certain behavior from an API. So that is MongoSM. That is uh, the context. What do we do with that? So here's the rebar config. Of course, it's unreadable. There is like lots of dependencies. Don't worry. We will zoom. Uh, but you can already see that there is a, a good bunch of them. Many of these dependencies are um, libraries that like we use, like Cowboy or Telemetry, things like that. Sometimes they are libraries that spawn out of MongoSIM. At some point, we saw that there was a certain piece of code that is not, strictly speaking, messaging related. And we can refactor it, take it out, make it a library so other projects can use it. And some other libraries are libraries for which we have contributed a lot. We were using them, and then we saw room for improvements. Let's start with uh, a few examples. So first, the easy ones, the stateless parsers. Of course, there is XML. As we say, MongoSIM is XML-based, so we have an XML encoder decoder. We use Jiffy for um, JSON. We have some CSV, basic thing. Let's see the first. Day 16, the simplest encoding decoding you can imagine. That was not part of the standard library. It was not coming with OTP. So many years ago, really long time ago, uh, one of uh, our team members, like every project had their own implementation of the Day 16 encoding because it's like five lines of code, but some one day, one, in the, one of our team members decided just to make it a library, publish it. It has several million downloads on, on hex. The tagline for the repo is the last time I hex a decifier line binaries. And one day, uh, we made like performance improvements to this algorithm, eventually it's a library. And one day, I saw that base 16 encoding decoding was given to, was put into OTP. Don't remember the version, maybe 24 or 23.3, something like that. And then I thought, That's, why, why didn't I just do that pull request before? Like, it's, it's the simplest code you can have. But our version was around three times faster for encoding and two times faster for decoding. So I thought, OK, I can just like port the performance improvements. Now this is an OTP. Encoding and decoding for base 16, something so simple, it's faster for everyone. How it works is very simple. The previous algorithm is literally going byte by byte, byte and expon uh, spawning these two characters that represent one, similar for decoding. The improved implementation goes uh, by machine words by machine words and looks it up on a table using um, binary comprehensions, which sadly are not that often used, but they are very good at generating less intermediate garbage. So that is one of the, like, the two reasons why this code is way faster. Binary comprehensions generate less uh, garbage to collect later. And it goes machine word by machine word and looks the result on a table. Instead of doing a case a if from the size, it's a lookup table with less uh, garbage. Another thing, XML. This is the most important thing in, in, in an XMPP server, as you can imagine. XML, the XML parser, again, the, the one that comes with OTP is slow and generates a lot of intermediate garbage. And this is a very hot code in an XMPP server, so it goes in an if. It's uh, binding to some open source libraries that uh, do the parsing and the encoding and decoding for XML. Very simple to use, but when I compare this uh, XML parser uh, with other XML uh, parsers that I could find in hex, this was by far the fastest one, with a really big difference to everything else Erlang Elixir that I found. But we are cheating, and this is important. The NIFs are not yielding, and if you have a NIF that runs for too long, it breaks the timing properties of the beam. So this is good for our use case because we are not parsing documents, we are parsing messages. Usually the payload is small. 
So it's fine, you save a lot of time by not yielding and also by having memory pools. So when you're constructing all your new binaries, instead of generating and allocating and deallocating memory, you have a static segment of memory. By default, it's 10 megas, you can configure. And so you save a lot of time moving memory around and allocating, deallocating. You save a lot of time uh, with uh, yielding and all these uh, scheduler tricks. So that is why this is the fastest, but don't use it with big documents because then the call takes long and you break uh, some latency properties of, of the beam. It has a configuration for not accepting packets bigger than and you can, uh, to the parser, say that if at any moment, it's configurable when you create the parser, and if at any moment you receive a packet bigger than a certain payload, it's not even scanned, so you never run into the trap. So this is configurable again. So I say, it fits the use case of messaging, don't use it for documents, it may fit more use case if it's interesting. Uh, another small thing, JID, this is the Jabber identifier, this a la email. Uh, by a long time ago, I think it was around Erlang 20 or 21, uh, we implemented the, part, the encoding and decoding in C again because it's uh, faster and everything was fantastic, but when the JIT compiler was released, the decoding was faster in pure Erlang code with the JIT compiler and decoding, encoding was, uh, not the other way around, encoding was faster in pure Erlang code and decoding was still faster in the NIF, but like, 5% faster. So the complexity of having C code, this is dangerous and more expensive to maintain for only 5% faster. We still have it there, but with the future JIT improvements, we will probably also keep it in, in uh, revert it back to pure Erlang. Another library that we use is uh, CSV. This is something, again, so simple. So simple, and I could not find a library that had encoding and decoding. There was uh, some library in Hex that had uh, decoding implemented as an if, and it was fantastically fast and using very little memory, and it was very good, but it only had the decoding, not the other one. So I needed like two libraries, one for encoding CSV, another library for decoding, and it's like such a simple algorithm, we could just have a single module that does both, and we made it a packet. This is the simple documentation. It also can take uh, streams. Then you have to create uh, your encoder, decoder, just as you would expect. Otherwise, you can just encode and decode inputs at once. We use this, for example, for GDPR, for dumping data. If a user requests all the data available on him on the server, we dump it all in a big CSV. It's not hot code, so it can be Erlang. This is very sporadically used. A few more things that uh, we have on observability, apart from what I mentioned before on the inspirations that uh, we gave to telemetry. Uh, these are some of the libraries that we use, and there is this interesting one, syslogger. Um, some Mongo Siam version, we wanted to introduce better logging. We introduced, uh, we migrated from Lager to OTP logger. I'm pronouncing lager, so you, it's clear that it's different, but I heard that the pronunciation is the same, but anyway. And we also gave like some backends with like logstash and so on. We also wanted to introduce uh, syslogger, and I saw that uh, Lucas Larson had uh, some hobby project on a syslogger backend for Erlang. And one of those free Saturdays uh, or hackathons or things like that. We wanted it, I asked uh, Lucas, hey, what's the status of this? And he said, I don't know, it was like, it's there. Do you want it, maintain it, whatever? So uh, he gave it to us, uh, we moved it to compile with Rebar and not auto tools, fixed a few bugs, made it a hex uh, packet. It's in hex, again, ready for everyone to use. Uh, a few more things. Uh, these two are interesting. Uh, fast TLS and fast uh, Scrum. So this comes from yet another version of Mongoose IM when we wanted to focus on security, especially authentication and improving, like starting to use TLS 1.3, things that uh, you can do. And we needed two things. Uh, XMPP requires a Scrum SHA-1 
but not all the others. We wanted all the others without introducing a lot of code duplication. And we also wanted channel binding, which is like some mixing of data between the network layer and the application layer to detect uh, man in the middle. So I don't want to bother you with a lot of details because I already gave a full 40 minutes talk on this in the last uh, Code Beam America in 21. But the gist of the idea is that humans are bad at passwords and machines are really good at guessing. So you want to make the guessing really expensive. So the machine cannot guess millions per second, but just a few. So there is an algorithm with a super nested hashing that you cannot parallelize that requires you to run this expensive operation. So the guess gets very delayed. This is configurable, how expensive you want to make it. And it's very cool to make it very expensive, but if your defender implementation is way slower than the attacker implementation, okay, he may not guess the password, but he can still DDoS you. So you, want, you don't want it to be more expensive for you than for the attacker. So there is a library that uh, abstracts all these different kinds of scam that uses another library that implements all this nested hashing in C, and that was uh, depending on the the complexity is configurable, it grows linearly, and also the memory usage grows linearly. In Erlang, in the C implementation is, uh, is uh, constant, regardless of the configure complexity. And for TLS, there is this library called FastTLS that does the encoding and decoding on the spot. So in the OTP implementation, your like when you upgrade that uh, connection from TCP to TLS, the socket is actually given to an SSL process that will receive the TCP socket with some scrambled data and has the keys to um, decode that, to decrypt. In this case, your process continues receiving the TCP uh, connection and has uh, the, the data, the keys that, that are needed to decode that on the spot using again NIFs that uh, go to, um, that are binded to OpenSSL. Because we wanted this TCP binding, we needed to like expose some uh, OpenSSL APIs to get the data that we need to, to bind it with the application layer. So we contributed here a bunch of pull requests. Before doing that, we realized that FastLS was not using Dialyzer, for example. So before touching anything, the first pull request was putting Dialyzer and discovering things that were broken because there were some. A bunch of other updates from new versions. This library was made by the times of uh, OTP 12 or 14. So all the new features of the new versions of OTP were given in the different pull requests. And then the plus for the channel binding. A few more libraries that we have. And we created segmented cache and we also use a lot of worker pools. What are they? So first, segmented cache. We needed cash for like, reasons everyone would need. Uh, for example, when you're sending a message to a room, the room fetches the list of users that belong to this room and then routes the message to each one of the users. You can cache that and not look it up in the database every single time. That's an example. The problem is that on a, um, a call server, if uh, lots of people send messages to a room, for example, you will fetch from the database lots of times the same data, but if you cache it, you want that data to be available as soon as possible for the next client sending a message to that, um, to that room. Otherwise, the next client will go to the database again. And many of the cache libraries that uh, we saw were usually routed through a GAN server. So you have a GAN server that owns the table, and the table is uh, public to read, but it's uh, private to write. So you send a message to the GAN server, and the GAN server writes that on the table. When you have a spike, and hundreds of users are sending a message to the same room, there is a delay by the time this process gets the information and puts that on the table, while the, all the other processes are looking for this data. So if you send messages to 20 different rooms, the GAN server will cache all of them linearly. So the room number 20 gets a delay, and then you're gonna fetch the members of the room number 20 all the other times, because it's happening in parallel. So how is this implemented? There is a public ETS table that everyone can read and write to. So you avoid these delays. 
ETS tables are using all the latest features that OTP had uh, given to ETS tables. So um, read uh, and write uh, concurrent with automatic, the um, decentralized counters, all those things. And what makes it even cheaper is the, um, the bookkeeping. You want to clean up your, your cache eventually. So usually you keep together with your record a timestamp and then periodically you have to check. So your, the record that you stored is a bit bigger and then you have to browse uh, through the table to see what you have to clean. We take a super lazy approach here, which is good when you don't need the granularity and it's way faster and uses less memory. We keep three tables. They are stored in a persistent term. And we also keep, uh, the references are stored in a persistent term. And we also keep an atomic counter. And the atomic counter at the beginning points at table number one. So all the reads and writes go to table number one. The reads, if it's not in number one, then check number two and then number three. If it's not there, not there. Periodically, the atomic counter is updated to point to table number two. And now table number two is the beginning. So now all the reads and writes will go to table number two. And table number one is the, the, the old one. So now you can clean it. And with this rotation, bookkeeping is extremely simple. You basically just rotate and dump the entire table and not pieces of it that you have to match, but just the entire table. So it loses granularity if you configure every table to be one hour and you insert exactly when it's migrated into the new table, your record will be there for two hours instead of three. It loses that granularity. But for our use case, it was fine. And hopefully it's useful for more people. What was lovely, what was really, really lovely, is that soon after, we got a pull request. A pull request from Pablo Costas from the Coruña University that I mentioned before, that he was the one that motivated me to prepare this talk and give Coruña now to you. Thank you, Pablo. We got a pull request with uh, stateful property-based testing using parallel workers, which to me was incredible. All my knowledge of property-based testing was the usual, you know, the reverse of a list of the reverse is equivalent to the list and, you know, the, the intro conference talk, that's all I knew about property-based testing. And I used to use it for uh, when I was implementing some C code just to check that it's equivalent to the Erlang code. So generate absolutely random inputs, whatever happens has to be the same. And that's all I knew about property-based testing. And then uh, we got a stateful property checking using parallel workers, uh, taking into account concurrency, uh, data races, uh, what is, uh, if it's introduced, it should be there. The magic of open source. More things, uh, worker pool. So there is this uh, library that we use in, in, in Mongoose IM called worker pool, that's for creativity, that has like a lot of uh, the functionality you would expect from a worker pool. You can configure how many workers, you can configure different strategies, so you can hash by key, you can check by the smallest uh, queue or the next by round robin. And one day, uh, I, I was um, like discussing this with Brujo and profiling how Mongoose IAM was using this worker pool. And perhaps it was not that important, but again, coming back to the topic, I tend to over-optimize every single detail because why not? Performance. I saw that the table um, the, the knowledge of the workers is stored in an ETS table. And every time you send a message to one of the workers, you fetch this ETS table, decide uh, your strategy and so on, and send the, the new task to the worker. And fetching from the ETS table means copying this data into your local process just to remove it later. And just to copy exactly the same data again later. So there was a lot of redundant copying and so on. So, I made this um, very simple load test, very simple profiling, where um, the idea is that the workers are just doing a ping pong. So the client just sends a ping and wait for the pong. The simplest thing that a worker can do. So this is a really unrealistic use case. Usually our workers will do big DB operations or things like that. But in that case, Fetching all the knowledge from ETS tables was 15.56% of the whole CPU time. 
And after putting that on a persistent term, it's uh, 0 0.22. So that's uh, very close to 0. With, with a worker pool, I want the worker pool to do the task that I have requested and not to think how to do it. So that's a nice improvement. In proportion, this is going to be very small compared to an actual task, like a DB operation. It probably went from like 0 0.5 to 0 0.1. It's not that big difference, but it's something. Big difference, I would expect at some point to be the memory consumption, because from a persistent term, you are not copying things again and again, because it's the same data. Just a funny thing about this, uh, by the time this was published, Brujo posted this on, on Twitter. Uh, a new version of a worker pool, my favorite Erlang process pool library, uh, thanks to contributors. And my Twitter, just by coincidence, this is not the answer to this post, my Twitter showed that this way, by Elon Musk just tweeting, friends and pools are great, just below that one. I always love the coincidence. HTTP tools, uh, so a small one, we have Fusco. Fusco is yet another HTTP client. Uh, HTTP one, process per request, and not one can server handling all of them. But most importantly, we have uh, GraphQL. So I say that at the beginning, now we introduce a GraphQL um, front end, a GraphQL API to Mongoose IM. So we looked for GraphQL implementations. For Erlang, there was one that had some limitations, like it accepted a single schema, but we have like different admin and client APIs and some problems with like type checking and so on. We made some pull requests, and look at the time of the pull request, it's November 21. These screenshots are from a couple of weeks ago and they are still not merged. So the library found a new home, basically. We just forked it and merged uh, our improvements. And now there is a GraphQL uh, library for any of you that wants to use uh, GraphQL in Erlang. And a few more things, uh, outgoing pools. So we have support for the archive, for example, for all the usual RTBMS pools. So Postgres, MySQL, Microsoft Server, etc. We also have support for RIAC, uh, Redis, um, many others, Cassandra, Elasticsearch. For those, we use the appropriate libraries that were exposed. But there is this problem with the Microsoft one, where the OTP implementation has some limitation and some bugs. And there is this issue still open. Again, this is a screenshot from a few weeks ago when I prepared the slides. And the issue is from May 2017, and it's still open. So around May 2018, maybe, after waiting for enough time, we just copy-pasted the whole code, fixed what needed to be fixed, made a hex package, and now you have a ODBC a hex library that we all can use as well. And a few more things that we use. Of course, we use uh, Recon. Mm, I have to say that not Erlang people, when I ask them to um, debug something for me on the shell when I don't have access, they are usually happy with the usage with Recon. And we also have, not as a dependency, a declared dependency in Mongoose IM, but we have a library called Erlang Doctor, uh, also from uh, our team. The basically enables tracing of every single event to an ETS table. Absolutely everything that happens. And then you get this recorded stream of events that you can, using ETS match specifications, you can browse, classify, backtrace, make statistics, rerun new functions, check full call stacks and check um, like how they were called in parallel. It's my usual go-to tool for when I have to debug something. And again, it's available in hex and as a, it even has a snippet that is very useful when you need to check something on a live uh, server. And the intro in GitHub, there is a snippet, just copy paste this in your shell, execute, and it downloads the module from GitHub and loads it in your shell. So you don't even need the dependency. Documentation is fantastic, very powerful. Don't use it in production, because it stores on the ETS table absolutely everything. So you run out of memory very fast. 
So in production, this is a bit unsafe, but on a development server, it gives you really good insight on everything that happened on the server. And that's all. These are my handles, that's uh, for Mongoose IM. That picture is a picture that I have everywhere, in, in the, even in my profile, my professional profile account, so if you see me on the internet and you don't know it's me, it's, it's that one. And that's all for me, thank you very much. <laughs>